mutinous Russian mercenaries who had been surging to Moscow agreed to turn back on Saturday to avoid bloodshed. That's according to the leader of the Wagner private army, Yevgeny Prigozhin. In an audio message, the former ally of Russian President Vladimir Putin said his forces got about 125 miles from the capital. Now the moment has come when blood could be spilled, he said, adding, we are turning our columns around. Reuters could not independently verify how far fighters got. The de-escalation of the major challenge to Putin's grip on power was brokered by Belarusian President Alexander Lukashenko, his office said. Under the deal, Prigozhin will move to Belarus, the Kremlin said, with safety guarantees for the leader and his men. It all marked a dramatic U-turn from just hours before, with Russian armored vehicles rolling past the Kremlin, checkpoints outside Moscow and warnings to residents to avoid going out. And in the previously rebel-captured city of Rostov-on-Don, troops began pulling out by Saturday night. The lightning insurrection appeared to unfold without much pushback from Russia's regular armed forces. Prigozhin had said his so-called March for Justice was intended to remove corrupt and incompetent Russian commanders he blames for botching the war in Ukraine. Ukrainian President Volodymyr Zelensky said the Wagner revolt exposed, quote, complete chaos in Russia. It came just as Kyiv is launching its strongest counteroffensive since the war began last year. Western Capital said they were watching developments closely, with U.S. President Joe Biden speaking with the leaders of Britain, France and Germany. But it's the most dramatic military political confrontation in Russia in the last 30 years, since the time of the collapse of the Soviet Union in the early 1990s. I think Putin emerges from this significantly weakened. I think if you're a member of the Russian elite or, in fact, a member of the Russian population, you're going to look at this and think, wow, a private army just drove on Moscow for most of the day. No one stopped them and they're allowed to leave and no real consequences after the president went on TV and
called what they were doing treason and made comparisons to 1917. Uh, if I'm an average Russian citizen, I'm thinking this guy who I thought was inevitable, there's no alternative to him. He's the strong man who brought Russia back from his knees. I'm thinking all of that doesn't look very convincing anymore. And it's not quite clear what happens to him. And of course, uh, if you're Yevgeny Prigozhin, you need to get a new food taster and you know, watch your back because uh, I would think a lot of people, including Putin, will uh, be rather angry with uh, what we saw here. And Putin often holds a grudge. He often wants to uh, take revenge on those who he thinks stabbed him in the back. And that's exactly what he said this morning was this is a stab in the back. So it's still too early to say how this is going to work out for Prigozhin. Uh, I would say a comeback is not out of the question. Him being dead, you know, in a few weeks or months is also not out of the question and many options in between. For Wagner, this looks like it might be the end. Those uh, Wagner troops who did not participate in this uprising are going to be integrated into the Ministry of Defense. Apparently everyone else is being dismissed but not charged. Look, at least in terms of the war in Ukraine that they're being absorbed by the Ministry of Defense, I suspect some of them will probably leave uh, and they will be losing some of their best trained uh, most battle-hardened forces and forces who helped enforce discipline along the front lines. So it could weaken the Russian military efforts somewhat, although not as much perhaps as if this had gotten completely out of control. I've seen an effort by the Ministry of Defense, but also something that was backed by Putin, because Putin himself basically backed the Ministry of Defense in this. You know, the idea was to subordinate Wagner troops, they would have to re-sign their contracts and they would have to go under the Ministry of Defense. And for Prigozhin, that meant losing his main tool, uh, losing the gun. You know how Mao Zedong had said that political power comes out of the barrel of the gun. Uh, and he was holding the gun. Now he was, he was being required to surrender the gun and he didn't want to do that. So uh, I think that that is what really caused the timing of this operation, but it's very clear that it was something that was being prepared over time. The easiest and clearest conclusion, though, uh, out of everything that we've witnessed is that Ukraine is on the winning end of this equation. Uh, Russia is in turmoil from the political leadership and uh, the military leadership at the senior echelons. I uh, don't know who to trust. I think they have this thorn in their side with uh, thousands of um, paramilitary troops that you know can't just dismiss out of hand. So some force structure is going to be allocated to figuring out how to manage you know, these thousands of troops. Uh, they are not going to be put into the fight and trusted to do their jobs. Uh, and then, you know, all the various kind of chain of command issues, who's in charge? Uh, can those assets be employed against Ukraine? Ukraine is going to have an enormous opportunity to, uh, to strike out at and liberate territory with Russia less well positioned to employ, especially national assets. You know, all those planes coming in from Russian territory, uh, um, those strike bombers and all those things potentially are, are going to be more distracted.